Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Advanced Treatments for IC webinar. Today's session features Drs. Jennifer Anger, Karen Eilber, and Victoria Scott. This webinar is, pre webinar is presented and sponsored by ICA's corporate partner, Femetry. Thank you for your support. Please note that this session will be recorded. If you are on camera, your video will be included in the recording. We will have a Q&A session following the presentation. To ask a general question related to this topic throughout the session, please use the chat feature. Once the Q&A session has started, you may also use the raise hand feature in Zoom. You will be asked to unmute yourself. If you aren't speaking, please be sure to stay muted. The doctors will answer as many questions as they can during the webinar. And finally, please complete the post-webinar survey. A link to the survey has been posted in the chat. Okay, it's time to get started. Without further ado, please welcome Drs. Anger, Alber, and Scott. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining us uh, wherever you are. It's either noon on our coast or 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, today, we're going to talk about advanced treatments for interstitial cystitis, um, which hopefully we'll be able to give you some insight as to uh, treatments that are offered and what's reasonable and maybe what's not necessarily considered on label per se. And yeah, like Jen Lee mentioned, hopefully we'll be able to answer all of your questions. So a fundamental question gets asked all the time before talking about any treatments is what is the cause of interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome? And the bottom line is we don't really know, which probably all of you on this call are already aware of, but one of the predominant theories is that there is a defect in this glycosaminoglycan or what we refer to as the gag layer of the bladder. And this results in increased sensitivity and pain. And another theory is that there is just a defect in the pain receptors. And one of the analogies that I often use with my patients is one of the theories why people have autism is they can't filter out all of the sound. I think the people who have pain receptor issues, your pain receptors can't filter out what you're not supposed to be feeling. So you're hypersensitive to a lot of things. So this glycosaminoglycan layer, if you take a view of the image on the left, all those little blue lines represent what an intact gag layer would look like. And this helps the barrier like also farther left of the blue lines are things that are basically excretory elements in the urine, which also makes the urine acidic, different th types of bacteria and other organisms. And on the right, where you see these defects, if they don't have this protective gag layer, all of these things can then penetrate the bladder wall and cause subsequent irritation and inflammation, which results in those typical symptoms of IC, which are urinary frequency, urgency, discomfort, and unfortunately for some people, severe pain. So what we don't know is, and we think that there might be variation uh, between different patients or what we call phenotypes or subgroups of IC. So we don't know whether there's a defective gag layer in some patients or in all patients. Um, we don't, um, We in many patients, the majority actually, um, their bladders, when we look with a camera, look normal. And so some patients, we definitely see what we call Hunter's lesions or Hunter's ulcers, where we can physically see a defect in the, the gag layer or in the, the epithelial lining. But again, many patients, it's totally normal. So what we see here is this phenomenon in uh, of what we call pelvic pain only versus widespread pain. And we see that up to 38% of patients with IC have other pain, um, other areas in their body that have pain, chronic pain, back pain, migraines, TMJ. And often when I, when I see patients, I will explain that I think of IC in many patients as kind of a migraine of the bladder. So we don't know why it happens, we don't always know why it starts, but our goal is to help control the pain. Next slide, please. And it may be that there is what we call neurologic upregulation of pain so that once you have pain, that it actually um, 
basically you become more sensitive to pain. And there's certain phenomenal um, phenomenon associated with chronic pain, what we call central sensitivity, that this initial bladder event, or um, let's say someone has an episode where the gag layer is defective, they have pain in their bladder. But once that becomes a phenomenon, they are then more sensitive or more susceptible to experiencing this pain again. Next slide. And so what we don't know is whether or not IC um, can develop in men too at the same rate as women. Interestingly, there's a very different data on um, the proportion of patients um, who are men and who are women with IC. And what we used to think is that it was much more common in women. And now we're like as high as 10 to one. And what we're actually seeing now is that the ratio is much lower. It must be, might be more like 1.6 or two women for every one man. And what we see the, uh, is that women tend to be more likely to be diagnosed with men uh, than men with IC and men who may have IC are likely to get misdiagnosed or treated with something else. So we really are focusing on um, trying to identify men who suffer with IC as well. Next slide. All right, so today we really wanna focus on our more advanced treatment options for IC, but um, our lifestyle changes and behavioral modifications are really our building blocks of any therapy. And even if we advance to medications or procedures for our IC patients, we really always kind of come back to making sure that, um, you know, if someone does have a flare, that we're really focused on making sure that we've optimized our lifestyle and behavioral modifications. So to briefly touch on these, stress reduction, I'm sure you've, you've all discussed this with your doctors before. We know that stress makes us more hypersensitive to pain. Um, so certainly anything we can do for stress reduction tends to help IC symptoms. Um, improved sleep, we know that IC can wreak havoc on your sleep. And so certainly anything we can do with sleep hygiene to improve sleep will help reduce stress and make life better. Exercise as tolerated um, is certainly super important for patients with IC diet. We know that most patients with IC are very sensitive to bladder irritants. And so ensuring that we're maintaining a diet that's um, tolerated by our own bladder. We always tell patients, you know, there are very restrictive elimination diets you can try, but it's always good to slowly maybe introduce some things that you love back into your diet to see if you can tolerate them once you've removed all the more um, aggravating factors. Improving sexual function, we always like to talk to our patients about this and making sure that we're doing everything we can to optimize their sex life because we know that IC can certainly make sex more painful and this can lead to a lot of fear and apprehension about sexual activity. Um, and then finally, supplements, non-prescription medications um, can be very helpful for a lot of patients. So for prescription medications, the American Urologic Association guidelines really focus on four different medications. The antidepressant category, um, primarily amitriptyline, we have the most data on, and this is really focusing on, as Dr. Anger mentioned, the centralization of pain um, and more of the nerve component of pain. So um, the tricyclic antidepressants are at higher doses used as an antidepressant, but in low doses, um, research has shown that they can help with a lot of pelvic and bladder pain. Um, they can cause sedation and drowsiness. So we certainly recommend taking them at nighttime, sometimes weight gain as well. But for some patients, they can actually help with the sleep issues as well. Elmeron, um, so pentosin polysulfate, this is a hot one right now. Um, this is our only FDA approved medication for IC, but as many of you are probably aware, the FDA did uh, recently, well, probably about 2020, I believe, um, issued some warnings about this medication. So we found that it can actually lead to macular degeneration and vision issues. So the guidelines now um, really emphasize that if you are on this medication, that you should really be seeing an ophthalmologist for retinal exam at least every six months or so. If it's something that you really wanna start, then certainly important to see an ophthalmologist, as, particularly if you have any ophthalmologic issues. And then as doctors starting this medication, we should always do a good ophthalmologic history with patients before we start it. 
Um, I would say just in talking to Dr. Albert and Anger about this, in our practice, we have been trying to avoid starting patients on it, but you know, we do definitely see some patients who come in and they say, look, I've been on this forever. It's the only thing that works for me, in which case we just make sure we have a good informed discussion and they're really plugged in with their ophthalmologist. And then our last two medications, cimetidine and hydroxyzine, are like antihistamines, um, so kind of like Benadryl, and they work on blocking histamine release. Histamine causes a lot of inflammation and irritation, and so these medications are used um, to kind of under the theory of reducing the inflammation in the bladder that could be contributing to a lot of the IC symptoms. Next slide. So to dive into our procedure options. Again, all these are supported in the AUA guidelines for IC, so they've all been studied. The, we have intravescular, intravescular bladder installations. These are smaller procedures performed in clinic. We can do a cystoscopy or a camera test where we take you to the operating room, we take a small camera, look in the bladder, and we can distend the bladder. We can burn Hunter's lesions if we see any or inject them with a steroid. Neuromodulation on a botulinum toxin A or Botox injections, and then finally a cystectomy. So bladder installations. This is our least invasive treatment or invasive treatment option, I should say, for patients with IC. Um, we do it in clinic. We take a small little catheter or a little tube and place it directly in the urethra and bladder. And then we instill a cocktail of medications into the bladder. So the benefit is we're instilling the drugs directly into the bladder. So much less risk of systemic side effects. Um, the downside is it is a procedure. So of course it can induce some pain. And we often tell our patients it's not uncommon that with bladder installations, initially you may have a flare, but typically the pain does get a lot better. Um, there, there's a lot of research on different cocktail options and we don't really know the best regimen um, or even the frequency, but typically we'll recommend weekly installations as an induction course for about six weeks and then maintenance installations as needed. And this is different for every patient. So some patients find that they do the six installations and then they're fine for a few months, maybe even a year or so. And they just kind of come back for rescue installations if they have a flare. And then maybe we would do like three weekly installations. Some patients find that the bladder installations are a good part of their maintenance regimen and preventing flares. So they find if they come every three months for an installation, that tends to prevent flares. Or if they know they're going to be in a stressful situation. So we can really play around with the regimen and tailor to each patient, determine, depending on how they find that they help them best. Um, common ingredients do include lidocaine. So this is just kind of numbing and soothing for the bladder. Heparin is supposed to help rebuild the gag layer, dimethyl sulfoxide or DMSO. Um, this is known to reduce irritation, possibly have some muscle relaxant um, effects. The sodium bicarbonate alkalinizes the urine and most likely makes the bladder lining um, absorb the other medications more readily. And then Elmeron sometimes will put this in a bladder installation as well. Typically, we'll do the installation in our clinic, either performed by a doctor or one of the nurses. Again, the installation itself is about 15 seconds or so, but the appointment might be 10 to 15 minutes. And then you'll usually try to hold the solution in your bladder for about two hours. With the exception of DMSO, that one we tend to have a much shorter dwell time because it's absorbed more rapidly, so that might be more like 15 to 20 minutes. Next, we have cystoscopy with steroid injections or fulguration as well. So this is a procedure, it can be performed under local anesthesia, but more commonly we're going to do it in the operating room um, because patients with IC have such sensitive bladders that we typically really don't wanna risk causing you severe pain in the office. Um, so again, we'll use our cystoscope or the teeny little camera. Um, we'll look in the bladder, we'll inspect the lining of the bladder, Typically, if we've decided on cystoscopy with steroid injections or fulgurations, we may have done a cystoscopy and a very gentle cystoscopy in clinic. Um, and we've seen some Hunter's lesions or ulcerations in the bladder, as Dr. Anger mentioned. Um, it's rare, but they can occur in about 5 to 10% of patients. And we know, we do know that if we see these lesions, we should absolutely treat them because this will improve your pain. Um, and so we will often either 
inject them with a steroid and or cauterize them. And this typically leaves helps the bladder lining heal and leads to good resolution of, of symptoms. They do tend to recur. And so certainly if we've done this procedure, you've had good success, and then maybe a year or so later symptoms come back, we know it's a good time to check the bladder again because the Hunter's lesions may have recurred and then we may need to perform an injection and or fulguration again. And then finally, um, with the cystoscopy, we can also perform a hydrodistension. So this is like a stretching of the bladder. We do do this under anesthesia as well. The theory here is we're stretching the bladder, so we're disrupting the nerve pain signals that are being sent from the bladder. It's not disruptive enough so that we destroy all nerve sensations. So you're still gonna feel when your bladder is full, you know, all the normal bladder sensations. But the main one that we're trying to fix is that pain. Um, and it's pretty successful for patients as well. Again, this is one of those where we warn patients, if there's a good chance you're gonna have a flare of symptoms before it gets better, but oftentimes pain will get a lot better. Um, so what we'll do is we'll gently fill the bladder to gravity. And this is really important because we don't want to over distend your bladder. You're asleep, so you can't give us the feedback that you know, you're feeling pain or the bladder is full or we're stretching beyond the functional capacity. So we'll fill to gravity at a low pressure. This is about 60 to 80 centimeters of water. And then we'll hold the solution in the bladder for about five to 10 minutes. Um, and this stretching often does work very well for patients. Although again, it's usually temporary and something that we do tend to have to repeat. All right, thank you, Dr. Scott. We're gonna move on to what is considered neuromodulation and two treatments fall into this category. Um, neuromodulation, if you were to ask us how exactly it works, the real answer is no one knows exactly, but we do know consistently the result that it tends to give. So a good comparison is, uh, scary as it sounds, we don't know exactly how anesthesia works, but we know the consistent results of it. So one general way of thinking about neuromodulation is we're kind of overtaking the abnormal impulse to an organ. Although interstitial cystitis as a diagnosis is not an indication for neuromodulation because people who have interstitial cystitis have urinary frequency and urgency, this can be covered by insurance for those who suffer from those symptoms related to their interstitial cystitis. So we use this device oftentimes also off-label for pelvic pain. And the good thing about both of the modalities that fall under neuromodulation that I'm gonna discuss is they're pretty much reversible. So the first one we're gonna talk about is posterior tibial nerve stimulation. And if you look at the photo on the woman sitting in the chair on the right, you're like, why is there a needle in her ankle? Well, this is basically, and the manufacturer of this doesn't like when we say this, but it's basically acupuncture is what it is. And the nerves of the bladder start in the pelvis, of course, and they end in the inner ankle. So when you apply the treatment to the posterior nerve, it eventually in a retrograde or backwards fashion will go to the main nerves of the bladder. The way we know that this is placed in the correct position is when the needle is in, when we turn on the stimulation, which literally is electricity, um, someone's foot should feel like it's falling asleep or tingly. Sometimes you'll even see someone's toe move. And the landmarks that are for this are the tibia or the bone in the leg. So we usually can get the needle in the correct position uh, pretty frequently. In general, people have to have at least three or four treatments in a row to see any difference. So the initial treatment is once a week for 12 weeks. When this device came out in the clinical trials, the great majority of people had some response by six weeks. So for me personally, if I have someone who has had six treatments and has noticed nothing at all, I don't find that it's worth going to all 12 treatments because in those same clinical trials, they didn't really see much benefit for anybody who had no response after six weeks. So at the worst case, you've maybe uh, wasted, if you will, six, six different treatments, but at least you'll know that if it doesn't work, it's no harm, no foul, you can move on to the next thing. And it's also a very subtle thing. So usually after about three or four treatments, someone might say, yeah, you know, I realized 
I was getting up four times at night. Now it's only three. And ideally by the end of the 12 weeks, someone is getting up a lot less. Also, after the initial 12 weeks, there is a maintenance period, which the recommended maintenance is once a month. I have found that most people will regress if you go from weekly visits to once a month. So I usually have my patients do a few treatments every two weeks, then a few every three weeks, and then get them to their maintenance of once a month. And the next neuromodulation treatment is called sacral neuromodulation. This has actually been out since the late 90s. It is very similar technology to a heart pacemaker. So we sometimes refer to this as a bladder pacemaker. So just like the tibial nerve stimulation, although there is not an FDA approved indication specifically for interstitial cystitis, it is approved for urinary frequency, urgency. It also has approval for non-obstructive urinary retention. So in English, as long as you don't have a physical blockage, maybe it's a functional blockage, especially people who have chronic pelvic pain who cannot relax their muscles to urinate easily. This is a good or potential device for that. Also in the last, I don't know, Dr. Zanger, Scott, if you can remember, somewhere in the last like maybe five to eight years, it also got indication for fecal urgency and fecal incontinence. So for people who have multiple issues, this device can really be a game changer. This goes, there's a lead or this wire, which you can see in the photo that goes from the battery, which is that kind of silver thing on the right side there, that goes alongside the nerve to the bladder. So it's important for people to understand this does not go into the spine. So there is not a possibility of having spinal injury with this device. Um, it's usually done on one side. There are some people who will implant on both sides. I personally don't do that. Nobody wants to have an implant in unless they know it's going to work for obvious reasons. And in general, for about 70% of people who have those symptoms, it will work, but for 30%, it doesn't. Because of that, there is a test phase. So the test can be done one of two ways. The easier way, both for doctor and patient, is in the office we numb the area where those nerves are, which is your low back, which is sacral nerve number three. And we put a temporary pacemaker, if you will, uh, using landmarks uh, of the bone. If you have x-ray in the office, we also use x-ray. Someone will wear a temporary device for a week. Unlike the tibial nerve stimulation that takes several weeks to see a result, you really should see a result of this within a week. And if that does work, then a permanent implant is scheduled. Another way to do a test is called a staged procedure where you go to the operating room two times, and this is often what we need to do um, for patients who have things like interstitial cystitis, because quite frankly, I think it's kind of mean to take someone who has chronic pain and do an office procedure. So I think it's a little more humane for a lot of people to offer this with sedation. So while they're asleep, we'll put a temporary uh, device in which if it works, it's actually the first stage of the permanent implant. So I know it can be confusing. In the office test, it is a totally temporary device. At the end of the week, we remove it. If you do a staged procedure, what is intended to be the permanent wire is implanted and it's placed in such a way that it should not get infected. So in the second stage, which is generally one week later, we just attach a battery. So there are two short procedures. There are two anesthetics, but for people who have chronic pain, it is kind of a better way to go to have anesthesia. Mm -hmm. um, next slide. And I kind of went over this. So the two ways to perform the procedure is you place the wire or what's called the lead inside the body with a temporary battery. And someone needs to have a minimum of 50% improvement. And it's not that we're aiming for someone to only be 50% better, but in the test, if you have 50%, when the final implant is in, there can be adjustments made to improve it. But within that first week, we like to see at least 50% improvement. And this kind of just repeats the same thing. The external battery, sorry about that. The external um, thing that you see there, everything is taped to someone's low back. So it's just kind of an annoyance for that one week because you do have something taped to your back and the, really the only limitations are, you know, no exercise and you don't want to get sweaty to have the dressing off. But again, for a lot of people doing a test in the office for something that can really help them 
not just their frequency and urgency, but I've had some people um, when we use it off label for pain have significant improvement in their pain as well. And I've done, um, I will do bilateral interstim or um, sacral neuromodulation for patients with pain. And like Dr. Albert said, even though we get it covered by insurance because of the frequency urgency indication, I've had patients that really just had pain without frequency urgency who did really well with it. And so I, I think that for uh, patients with IC that's refractory to medication, uh, I think in my um, best results have been with neuromodulation and really it makes a, a seems to make a big difference. Um, it's not as effective for interstitial cystitis as it is for let's uh, overactive bladder, which is its most common indication, but it's definitely um, wor worth a try. And even though it seems, oh, this is invasive, it's really, you know, not that invasive. If it doesn't work, you have a little scar over the buttock area. So, well, what else do we have? Um, uh, we've, uh, Dr. Albert and I are both participants in a trial. It's actually a randomized trial looking at Botox um, for interstitial cystitis um, by AbbVie. And many of you know, um, I know at least I'm no stranger to Botox. <laughs> and I, it, it paralyzes the muscles. That's why it works in the forehead. When given in the bladder, it partially paralyzes the bladder muscles. So it will calm the bladder down. And so um, it tends to work the best for people with frequency, urgency as and leakage, but the majority of patients with IC also have these overactive bladder symptoms. And there is some, um, some preliminary studies that show it also helps with pain. Um, this is done, um, it can be done in the office. Again, um, like Dr. Albert said, I don't like putting patients with pain through pain. So we can also do it in the operating room with some sedation or an anesthesia. Um, we usually do a small amount of Botox, which is like a hundred units. The risk of, um, the biggest risk of Botox is that within seven to 14 days, it can work too well where the patient has difficulty emptying their bladder in particular, um, where they can't pee and need to temporarily use a catheter. Um, when we say temporarily, it's usually not more than a few weeks, let's say four to six weeks max, and then the Botox will tend to wear off. Um, but the nice thing about uh, participating as a trial that's randomized is we should soon have you know, data that, um, that shows us, is this actually um, effective in IC? But it looks like prelim preliminarily it is at least in in some uh, patients. Next slide. So now I want to talk about this is sort of the when all else fails. Um, now and before we get to cystectomy, which is removal of the bladder, another option to test if a patient is a candidate for bladder removal is to place um, either an indwelling urinary catheter through the urethra or what's called a suprapubic catheter. So we actually have, a, we can do this under anesthesia um, or interventional radiology can place a catheter that goes directly into the lower abdomen, right above the pubic bone. The urine will then drain to a bag. And so for patients who have severe pain with bladder filling, um, putting the urine directly to what's called a leg bag, where the urine will go to the leg, um, will relieve their symptoms. If they have, let's say, a, um, a bladder that's more end stage, meaning the patient's had IC and their bladder doesn't stretch normally. So before going to cystectomy, I will usually do a test where we try a catheter to see if, if it, the catheter relieves the problem, then very likely cystectomy will relieve the problem. Cystectomy is removal of the bladder. This is um, not something we um, we uh, take lightly. This is a big surgery. And what it entails is removing the bladder. Um, there are cases where you just divert the urine into a separate, um, basically you can see on the top, right? That's a stoma. So we take a small piece of intestine connect the ureter tubes to that piece of intestine and the urine will go continuously into a bag. So that can be done actually without removing the bladder. However, 
patients who have had IC, you know, we talked about that phenomenon of central sensitization. Even if um, the urine is diverted, they may still have ongoing bladder pain. So we tend to remove the bladder when we do these diversion procedures. On the lower right, you can see an option which is called a catheterizable stoma, where the bladder is removed, but then a new bladder is created out of intestine. And then the patient can catheterize that little, if you see the little stoma on the lower right-hand corner, and that means that they can um, allow their bladder to fill and have no bag, but then when they need to empty their bladder, they can put the catheter in and empty the bladder. So that's a nice option. However, there are reports of patients who have had um, interstitial cystitis and they have, we do see reports of them developing pain in the new bladder. So my preference for patients who have, um, who are undergoing cystectomy is to create this um, ileal conduit on the upper picture where the urine goes directly into a bag that's right on the abdomen. And then even though it sounds kind of dreadful, patients who have it have a huge amount of relief and the pain is usually not an issue any longer. Next slide. And I think that wraps up our talks and we would love to, we, we um, have, see a lot of really great questions on the chat so we can go ahead and move forward to the Q&A. I don't know if uh, Dr. Scott or um, Eilber had any additional comments they wanted to chime in before we move on. I think the only thing I want to add is, you know, like all the patients that we see, you know, you can see the frustration, you know, in some of the chat comments. I see is one of those conditions where I would love to say we have a magic bullet, but it's typically multimodal. It is working with your doctor, physical therapist, nutritionist, whoever, and it's an ongoing thing. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that, you know, it always makes me sad when patients say, you know, they didn't feel like they could have an open conversation or ask questions or they were embarrassed to suggest things. So even if something isn't appropriate, I want my patients to throw things out there, you know, whether they think they want to try whatever herb or supplement or something, as long as it's not going to harm them, I think it's okay. My job is, you know, to keep them out of trouble, but some of the things that we recommend are things that I, our patients have told us over the year that we would not have known otherwise. So just want everyone to know that it is multimodal. It is a team approach. And hopefully you'll be able to find someone, you know, that's in your corner that's willing to work with you to alleviate your symptoms. So with that, um, oh, unless Dr. Scott, you have a comment? Thing, yeah. yeah, sorry. One more thing to add. Um, Along the lines of the importance of the team approach, um, this isn't exactly in the AUA guidelines. We do really try to stick to the guidelines, but Drs. Anger, Eilber, and I have worked pretty extensively with our pain management colleagues as well, and not pain management in the sense of like narcotics. We absolutely really try to stay as far away as we can from narcotics, but more in the procedures they can do with injections. Um, so I think that's another specialist to absolutely consider seeing if you haven't already discussed it with your urogynecologist or urologist and you feel like your pain's not being adequately treated so they can perform injections in the pudendal nerve, particularly if you have some concomitant pelvic floor muscle dysfunction um, and they can do larger nerve blocks as well. Um, we can do pelvic floor blocks and then physical therapists also who, who can help with nerve and more muscle release. Um, so those are just other things to consider. I, um, and maybe just to start, I'd love to just take the question about Elmeron, um, only because my um, Dr. Lowell Parsons is um, was the man who invented it, and I work with him at UCSD, so I've had a lot of conversations with him about Elmeron, and I think, and we've seen, you know, um, FDA warnings followed by lawsuits, and I think what's important about Elmeron is you don't see, you know, it, um, what largely happened was patients were aware of the warning and then they went and had visits to the eye doctor. But really any uh, pigmentary maculopathy, which is very different than macular degeneration, 
largely happens, well, exclusively happens after patients have been on Elmeron for the equivalent of um, 100 milligrams three times a day for 15 years. So I think what, what the guideline really say is, you know, if it's working for you, just get an annual checkup with your eye doctor. Um, they, and, and Dr. Buffington had suggested, had, um, who's really great, he's, I, I know uh, him from a long time ago, he's done studies using uh, the feline interstitial cystitis, which are fascinating. But um, there is, the studies do vary in the literature surrounding Elmeron, but there are, you know, as we know, not, not everything doesn't work for every patient. So for patients who really do well with it, um, I don't usually stop it. I just make sure that that we make it, make sure it's um, dosed safely, and that they're um, that they get those evaluations. Um, but it's hard. We don't, you know, the the options. We don't have a magic pill as, as much as we wish we did. Okay, so let's. So um, I noticed that, um, thank you so much, doctors, for um, the presentation. I noticed you were answering some of the chat, some of the questions. So um, would you like me to just go back and kind of go through them? Um, okay, let's see. We have somebody that says, my docs don't want me to take Elevil because of its link to dementia. What do you think? I really don't know of that connection. I mean, the anticholinergics, I mean, Elevil is often used as an antidepressant and the doses that are typically used for chronic pain, at least the ones that I find successful are not even high enough to treat depression. Um, I mean, having said that there's risk benefit to everything, you know, nowadays, especially with our electron medical record, if you try to order something like, you know, oxybutynin or anything for overactive bladder, there's always a concern for risk of dementia. Um, even on that token, because a lot of older people are also using these drugs, the question is, was that a natural part of aging versus how much really was causing dementia? But, you know, and I'm speaking for myself, it was the choice of maybe being a little off versus finally getting out of pain. I might choose mm -hmm. the latter, but everyone has to make, you know, an, an educated choice. But I mean, Elevel, I don't know, Dr. Anger, Dr. Scott, you can pipe in, but there really hasn't been a lot of um, concerns, at least that I've heard even from pain management people about that. Right. And like you said, it's the um, this the anticholinergic side effects that are concerning. What's more concerning for me, and I have you know mem uh, memory issues in my family, so I'm very aware of, of me memory preservation. And um, Sleep deprivation is actually worse on your memory than than something like a side effect from Elevil. And um, so I think, uh, you know, quality of life, if you're able to take a med that relieves your pain and gives you sleep, it's probably going to not, it may in fact improve your memory once you're able to get that sleep. But I think, um, and the other thing is, um, you know, when we looked at dosing, you, you want to, you know, take the the lower dose that will, you know, the lowest dose that will still relieve your symptoms. And it's probably okay, especially if you've had re relief from it or you're thinking about relief. Cause I have seen when the patients take Elevil, I'll, I remember this classic when it was a young woman, she was like 19, miserable in pain. And I tried her on uh, Elevil. And then a month later, it was like, she was like a new person. So it's always worth it. If that patient ends up being you, it would definitely be worth it. I'm going to pop back. Um, we had somebody ask, um, how does one go about finding an IC urologist specialist? Um, and I believe there was some answering that started. So I'll just go back to that one real quick. Dr. Scott, you want to take that one? So um, in general, um, urogynecologist or urologist should have good training in management of IC, but unfortunately that's not always the case. Um, so I think certainly, you know, if you're asking your primary doctor for a referral and um, they don't necessarily know anyone, then there are a lot of good resources online in terms of, you know, Facebook communities, social media communities that can be of, of good um, help. I think the SUFU, I'm not sure if they have a public listing of its members, does it? I don't think so. But, there but are we certain can medical, also help. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're happy to help because we know probably most, at least a few people in every state. Um, but there are certainly 
medical societies that we belong to where we know everyone there is extremely informed. So you're right, it's absolutely very tricky. Um, but I think just keep asking people um, and, and certainly send us emails or whatever, we're happy to help as well. Whether, whether it's IC or something else, I think it's word right. of mouth. And I think Dr. Scott makes a good point where uh, it looks like you already, you know, involved in IC and looking for someone. So if you don't have, you know, friends or acquaintances who have IC and have a great doctor, yes, we're happy to, you know, give references. And the nice thing about now that telemedicine is available, as long as someone is in your state, even if they're hours away from you, you can always at least do, you know, some type of telehealth consult. Uh, U of Miami definitely has at least three doctors I can think of who are probably going to be great. Great. Um, next question. Um, can the drug Librax be helpful? Yeah, I think any medication that is a muscle relaxant potentially, especially um, if people have pain from like a pelvic floor dysfunction, from not being able to relax, from being contracted all that time of having pain. I, you know, if nothing else has helped, I think it's always good, no pun intended, think outside the box. Um, and, you know, Librax is a, it is, I think, a combination of a muscle relaxant and an antacid. So potentially, yes, I, I have not had a lot of experience with it, but I know that some people mm -hmm. that I've seen, because they also have like irritable bowel type syndrome symptoms, will mm -hmm. actually benefit from that for both the bladder and the bowel. Great. Um, we have someone that said they've been living with um, IC for 40 years, and um, they talked about um treatments, including a Medtronic inner stem implant. And they said that it worked for a while, but um, due to some issues with the urologist, uh, something else happened. But um, she just said, um, thank you, you know, for your presentation and just wanted to share that. Um, it says, next question, can patients with FMS and disc disease benefit from these nerve treatments? Jen, so you want to take that? Oh, sure. So in terms of the disc, do you mean, I think, are we thinking uh, FMS, five, are we thinking of fibromuscular disorders? I'm not totally I sure. Believe, I believe that's it because I, I think they, yep, yeah, fibromyalgia and disc. Fibromy okay, I perfect, think that's perfect. what they started another question. Yes. About okay, perfect. So in terms of disc disease, um, you know, like Karen had mentioned, the, um, the interstim or the Exonix brand, they're actually beyond this, um, the, this, the, discs are in the sacrum. So it's more of a peripheral nerve stimulator. The The common question we we receive is if I um, have disc disease, will this work or not? And, and I usually say, well, it's, it's worth a try because it's a peripheral nerve stimulator, but it won't necessarily help with, um, with stimulating nerves that are above that level. But, and then in terms of fibromyalgia, really we, we think about, um, two kinds of categories of treatment. One is that bladder centered treatment versus the body, um, you know, treating the whole body or that um, patients who might have other disorders, fibromyalgia. So let, uh, so usually when you have something else like fibromyalgia um, or other, let's say migraine, we tend to treat the IC uh, more systemically, really focusing on something like, let's say, Elevil that's going to address pain in other parts of the body as well. However, if there is specific bladder-centered pain, uh, ideally with some with frequency urgency, it never hurts to try uh, in sacral neuromodulation for the bladder-specific symptoms. And just to add to that, because people can be very complicated, uh, even if you have a pain stimulator, you can have one placed on the other side. Having a heart pacemaker is not a contraindication. We hear stories all the time that people are told they're not candidates for it for reasons that are actually not true. In the past, these devices, uh, you were not able to have MRI, but uh, you also now these days can have an MRI. And I think just back to the comment uh, about the person who did have an inner stim, um, I guess the question is, if you still have one, because it sounds like there was an another urologist error, long story, just because you have them before that worked, if they took it out, you can always have another one. But again, recommending you see someone who is experienced in planting these. Another comment on nerve issues. Um, I think we're 
learning the benefit, even if patients have neurologic conditions like multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, um, now that they're MRI compatible, we're learning, hey, these are really helpful for patients with all kinds of nerve issues as well. So pretty rare that a patient would have a con complete um, or absolute contraindication. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, does this also help with pelvic pain when sitting? And I'm assuming they're referring to the nerve treatments. I think it depends on what the cause is of why you have pain with just sitting. Um, you know, that's, it, it can, again, it's, it is an off-label use for pain. Um, that's a hard one. To, I'm sorry not to be able to answer more specific. It's a hard one to know. I mean, that's assuming that there's nothing wrong, like with the bone or with the actual, um, like anything anatomic in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. The next one but is. Is, and that's where we talk about pain management. Cause that sounds like that could be related to pedendal neuralgia. And we don't have enough data on, there are, you know, the, the, it's this third sacral nerve root that's um, kind of uh, targeted with sacral neuromodulation. So in many cases, it could be worth trying, but th when it's there's other pain beyond the standard indications, like if it is pedendal neuralgia, then that's when we might work on different kinds of um, nerve blocks with pain management as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one um, is two. Um, it says, what about AZO and then, and what about TENS treatments? Can I take this one, ladies? <laughs> so yeah, AZO is, um, it's just, well, they have a different, a few different versions of AZO, but typically it's phenazopyridine, which is just pyridium. Uh, it's the stuff that probably everybody on this webinar has taken the turns of urine orange. If it helps, great. The only things to be cautioned about phenazopyridine are um, one of the reasons why on the box it says not to use for prolonged periods is there is a phenomenon called tachyphylaxis, which if you use it too frequently, your body gets used to it. But then if you don't use it for a while, it works again. The other thing is if you take it for prolonged periods of time, everything will turn orange, including um, like eye discharge. So people can get contacts turn orange your vaginal discharge. So when everything starts to turn orange, probably a good time to stop. Um, and then as far as TENS units, there is some data coming out, not that is published, I've seen abstracts. And I personally do have some patients who use a TENS unit like we do for that percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. People who travel a lot, who cannot come for treatments. Um, the TENS is it's hard because you're a little bit comparing apples and oranges because with the percutaneous treatment, we're literally putting the needle through the skin right adjacent to the nerve. With a TENS unit, it is those little um, pads uh, that typically are used for low back pain. So the penetration of the current might be a little harder to get, but you can buy a TENS unit on Amazon. You can place it along that path, your tibial nerve. And I have some patients who like I said, travel a lot and in between them coming to the office, they will do a TENS unit. The only thing we can't tell you is what is the exact um, schedule or regimen. So you kind of have to follow what we do for the, the percutaneous treatment. You guys have anything to add, Dr. Anger, Dr. Scott? Yeah, I've seen some studies where they look at putting the pad along the posterior tibial nerve and then somewhere they actually put on the sacrum too. So you could always play around with that. Thank you. Um, next question. What are some examples of things that you now recommend based on patient feedback? Thing that pops in my mind, when this was years ago, I had a man who had interstitial cystitis and God love him. He let me try everything on him and just could not really significantly improve him. And I didn't see him for years and he came back and he was actually doing really well. And he just came back to tell me that the thing that helped him the most was alkaline water, which I would really not have thought that would have worked. I kind of thought it was a little bit hokey, but, you know, he was for his all intents and purposes, like a really reasonable guy. I don't think was placebo. So I do think, you know, things like alkaline water, patients have had good luck with aloe juice, aloe capsules, um, you know different supplements, which is one of the reasons why we help put femetry together. So again, back to that multimodal comment that I made earlier, it's not usually one thing, but you know, these are things, again, I didn't even know really what alkaline water was, but I do recommend it quite a bit now. 
Thanks. I would agree with that. Absolutely. <laughs> I feel like I've learned so much from my patients, um, particularly about supplements and more of the things that we don't have in our guidelines. Um, but we always appreciate hearing from patients what has worked for them because they're the ones who are obviously most dedicated to trying things, doing the research on the other options. Great. Thank you. Um, it looks like Kathy's looking for um, people in New York City. So if you want to uh, direct message her, that would be great. It looks like she's also on Facebook. Um, next question. Um, what types of food should we stay away from? The web gives some mixed reviews. Jen, you should take this since you were kind of in charge of publishing the consumables. Yes, I I didn't hear the, can you repeat the question? I'm looking for it right here. Sure. Um, the, what types of food should we stay away from? Oh, the perfect. web gives some mixed reviews. And the, we, I honestly refer um, my patients to the ICA website because that's really, um, really where, where we get a lot of our information for patients. So um, it's interesting because studies that it was um, Rob Mould when looked at a group of women in New York and largely had um, the, what many of you already know, spicy food, red wine, um, tomatoes, chocolate, right? All the, the typical foods. What was interesting is we actually did a similar survey for veterans, so about 50% men and women, and they had very similar patterns. So uh, really showing that this is something that is almost, um, I, you know, in my mind, I think if someone has food sensitivity, that it almost makes them, um, you know, it, it's sort of consistent. It helps me diagnose IC in many ways. And so, um, but we don't all, we also don't want to make patients have a, um, they don't all need to go on a, you know, very strict um, diet necessarily. Um, I, I love the, the elimination diet is, is a kind of nice if you're not sure what foods are your are triggers for you and then you can add back foods one by one and then you under so until patients have an understanding of what what bothers them but um you know it does seem if you look at sort of the and again going back to Lowell Parsons the idea that acidity he calls it cations which are basically um potassium molecules that are that are increased in an acidic environment that um, that worsens pain. So I, I do believe in that concept of um, like what we talked about and, and our supplement has that as well, that you can take certain things to prevent, to reduce acidity, acidity in the bladder and that that could be very helpful. But um, so we know it's a real phenomenon. I think we're still learning um, which specific foods and for which people um, do, you know, how do we make those recommendations? But I think we're getting closer. Great, thanks. Um, do ozone treatments work on Hunter's ulcers? Is that like hyperbaric oxygen? I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's ozone. I think it's um, separate, yeah. I mean, there's I mean, not really a lot of data for that, even for like hyperbaric oxygen. So, you know, it's one of those things where I doubt it's going to harm you. If the cost is really high, I'm not sure it's worth paying for not knowing what the benefit is. But, you know, again, if you are fortunate enough to be able to afford treatments like that, as long as it doesn't, you know, hurt you, I think it's okay to try. We just don't really have any good data to share with you about that. Specifically for IC, yeah, mm. hyperbaric oxygen treatment has been studied in like radiation cystitis. So patients who've had cancer and terrible bladder um, complications, and and they do have some benefit. But in those patients, we're typically talking more about significant bleeding, contraction of the bladder. For Hunter's lesions specifically, the 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 best, at least going by our guidelines. Um, the treatment with a directed treatment with a steroid injected into the uh, ulcer and or cautery, I usually do a combination of both, has been shown to have significant impacts on pain. And then for patients who don't respond to that, then that's when, and I think there is a question on the chat about cyclosporin, then you can do a short course of cyclosporin, which is sort of like a systemic anti-inflammatory. Other than that, I don't, that we don't have great data on what to, on um, like ozone or other all treat treatments for ulcers. 
Okay, thank you. Um, next question, does natural hormone therapy work? I believe that's what they were typing. I feel like we need yeah, Dr. Eilber. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the question is what, you know, in natural hormones, if you, you know, there are like Premarin is made from the urine of pregnant mares. So that's a natural hormone. It depends on what you mean. If you mean like compounded hormones, but regardless, um, for sure, women who are perimenopausal or menopausal, even if you don't have IC, you can start having what we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause. You can ha start having bladder and vaginal symptoms from that. So yes, uh, I think any hormone therapy can potentially help a woman who is perimenopausal or menopausal. It is not part of necessarily the AUA guidelines, but again, for the interstitial cystitis patient, you have to treat the whole patient with, you know, multimodality therapy. Okay. Um, next question is, why is Urabel no longer available? I'm having trouble finding URO MP now. Good question. <laughs> Good question. I don't know, but it is hard to get. I can tell you that one of the reasons why, in even before it was hard to get, it was not covered by insurance any longer because the insurers got really smart. Those are considered compounded medications. And although the individual ingredients in something like Urabel or these combo drugs are FDA approved, as a combination, they are not. And so insurers said, well, we're not going to pay anymore for medications that are FDA approved. You actually look at those medications. They don't have FDA approval, even though the individual ingredients are. So insurers quit paying for those a long time ago. I know it's frustrating. Um, we love your bell, but it is right. my patients are saying it's really hard to get. So unfortunately, I don't know why. My guess is it's just not profitable enough. Hmm. And, and your bell's like you could, it's like the period peridium you could just take indefinitely, which is why we love it. But I must say, I've never actually seen orange tears or saliva, Dr. Eilber, Dr. Scott. Have you actually seen that? Uh, I, I, I feel like peridium is probably safer than we think. <laughs> I've definitely seen orange vaginal discharge. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But that's because most of our patients, we tell them not to take it too long. I mean, it's, but they're the people who didn't know and they just keep taking it. Right. Okay. Next one. Um, does bioidentical hormone treatment help with IC? I think I'm going to give the same answer with the natural hormone. So bioidentical, um, by definition, is a compound that is identical to our naturally occurring hormone. So bioidenticals, although somehow they have become synonymous with compounded hormones, Technically, prescription hormones are also bioidentical because our body recognizes them as the same chemical type composition. So there is, a, again, a, this misconception that bioidentical hormones are safer, but bioidentical hormones are both available prescription, um, which are like FDA approved drugs, as well as compounded. And regardless of however you get your bioidentical hormones, yes, they can be helpful for IC, especially in those perimenopause or menopausal women who are suffering from genitourinary syndrome of menopause. Great. I just want to chime in because I see our friend uh, and colleague, Dr. Christine Whitmore is here joining us. So she's an amazing resource for those in the East Coast. Um, I believe she's in Pennsylvania. I'm not totally sure. And you're welcome to say hi, Dr. Whitmore. <laughs> Oh, there she is. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I actually practice in uh, southern New Jersey right now, and I just want to compliment our speakers for our wonderful presentation today and hitting the most important points and just all of us realizing that interstitial cystitis is not alone. It could be bladder-centric, most of the symptoms related to the bladder, but there are other issues going on. Um, in the muscles, in the skin, in the bowels, and other autoimmune disorders. And I think going forward, we need much better research to put it all together. And <clears throat> the MAP study, which is funded by the NIH, the Multidisciplinary Approach to Pelvic Pain, which our ladies here have been involved in, um, will help us get some of those answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining. 
Um, I'm going to read the next one. I think maybe you answered some of it, but it says, what percent of patients with a sacral neuromodulator implant are satisfied? I have heard horror stories about this procedure. What are your mm -hmm. thoughts on cyclosporine to prevent reoccurrence of Hunter's lesions? So yeah, just talking about neuromodulation, uh, we only, and, um, and just to uh, like comment on sort of what Dr. Eilberg said is we, we ideally think about if you're 50% better than we go on to the second stage. So we don't even put it in unless you're notably better. Um, the, um, it, the rates, and to be totally honest, the rates with interstitial cystitis, the success rates are lower than with overactive bladder, which has got to go, got to go, not making it to the bathroom. Um, but I've had, I would say the majority are at least 50% better. Um, occasionally now patients, and we had talked about the central pain phenomenon, patients with IC are, there is a higher rate of later getting the device removed. And I think that could be because patients who have IC are more sensitive to pain. So they might be more likely to feel annoyed from the device. But again, these can be completely removed. So in with overactive bladder, um, success rates of going on to stage two, so 50% or better, about 80 to 90%, depending on the, the implanter. With IC, they're more like somewhere between, I think in my own hands, maybe around 70 to 80 percent in the literature can be a little bit lower, but I think it's still um, a very successful treatment and, and worth a try if you're thinking about it. Thank you. So this is neat. And then oh, okay. and actually, uh, uh, Judy Gibson said that the inner sim was a godsend and relieved 100 percent of her pain. So that's nice to hear, Judy. Well, I don't want to argue the part about hearing the horror stories. I, I think back to, you know, I hear all the time someone had treatment for something or their friend and it was horrible. You also have to pick the right providers. So someone who only does interstim a few times a year is not going to give you a good office experience. They're not used to doing those procedures. So make sure, again, that you see someone who is experienced for those because anything can be a horror story if you don't see the right person. And the cyclosporine, um, I have not used it personally. I know that it is, um, I, I believe that there's a paper that showed it was equivalent to Elmeron, which, you know, people will argue if it's that great. Uh, you know, it, it makes sense because cyclosporine is um, used for, um, to prevent rejection, like in transplant patients. So it suppresses the immune system, similar to why we inject steroid into Hunter's lesions. Again, the only problem is that it's definitely off-label, and I, I would imagine cyclosporine is probably not a cheap drug. And it is, yeah, in terms of like our guideline is recommended not to be taken chronically as much as for patients who don't respond to an injection of the Hunter's lesion. But um, so these sorts of things like steroids and cyclosporine, they may make you feel better, but they have more side effects if they're used chronically. So we're just a little more careful with those meds. Thank you. Um, the next one is what about natural supplements for pain frequency? Can the doctors recommend? Funny you should ask. <laughs> <laughs> so based on a lot of the things our patients have told us, and you know, I don't want to take up too much time telling the story, but the bottom line is we had a one of our trainees was with us and saying, you know, you guys recommend supplements so much and some of the more, you know, common ones that you do, why not put it all together into a supplement that makes it easier to take and the ones that are also have some research behind it, which is how we got involved in Femetry because we saw our patients taking the same ingredients and we want to make sure that at least again, you know, science is not hard for a lot of supplements, but at least the ones that we do know and just from our own clinical experience. So I am a huge proponent for supplements for myself for conditions other than IC. I had some hair loss issues. So I am all about supplements, but also with the um, warning, be careful because I also had my physical the other week and apparently my vitamin D level was almost toxic because I took that to the next level. So just everything in moderation. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, 
Next question. Do any of you use or recommend vaginal suppositories made from Valium, Baclofen, and Lidocaine? Do you re recommend use of estrogen as part of a bladder protocol? Dr. Scott, you want to take that one? Yeah, I think we all um, really like to use vaginal suppositories, um, particularly if we identify concomitant pelvic floor muscle dysfunction. So these are, again, directly delivering these, ner these medications to the the nerves and the muscle, and so hopefully less systemic side effects. Although even with the vaginal volume, you can still have some, you know, systemic absorption. Um, they're tricky to get, so you typically have to find like a good compounding pharmacy. Um, but these are are fantastic um, treatment modalities. Regarding the estrogen, again, like Dr. Albert said, um, hormones are great for perimenopausal menopausal women and certainly can help reduce some of the aggravating IC symptoms. The vaginal estrogen is great because if you don't wanna take it systemically, then you can use it just for the targeted genitourinary symptoms. And just to add for men, we would we actually recommend them, you can use them intrarectally as well. Not the estrogen, just the value. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next up. Um, what is the best way to diagnose IC? I've seen a couple urogynecologists, and one says I have IC, and the others say I don't. And some of my symptoms don't match typical IC symptoms. So how do you know which treatments may help? I've tried many of the non-invasive treatments for bladder pain and frequency with no help. Dr. Angry, want to take that one? Sure. So... Um, you know, we used to have, uh, it used to be considered a diagnosis by exclusion. Like if you don't have this and this, then you have IC. And now we really, to because people were not getting diagnosed adequately, especially men. And I just want to, I love that there's men on this, uh, on this webinar as well. Cause again, it's really underdiagnosed in men. Uh, it, all that you need for a diagnosis of IC is bladder centric pain for six weeks in duration that's not associated with a urinary tract infection. So, um, but you know, sometimes they may have a UTI and then the pain persists and then it takes a little longer than six weeks to identify whether or not it is in fact IC. What we often see is patients who are treated maybe one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four times with um, antibiotics only to discover, wait, these are, all my cultures are negative and that's how we diagnose it. Now, um, uh, our practice, at least my practice, is once patients have clinical symptoms consistent with IC, I perform a cystoscopy because I like to identify if I have patients with Hunter's lesions, just because we can treat those very differently um, with a local treatment with the injection. So my practice is to include cystoscopy as part of my workup, but I don't, um, but really all you need is that clinical um a clinical diagnosis basically made by history and physical exam. But I'm interested in what my my colleagues' thoughts are um, on that too. I would absolutely agree. I was gonna say I, I absolutely agree with that approach. I think I don't cyst, I don't perform the cystoscopy on everyone. I think someone had the comments, you know, I'm in so much pain. I don't want more pain from these procedures. So I think just having the discussion with patients is really important. Some patients, you know, are going to come to you like they have seen patients. I've been seeing doctors for five years. Okay, that patient, you know, probably more likely going to want to have the cystoscopy compared to the more newly diagnosed patients. So just absolutely having good discussions with patients and and coming up again with the best treatment that's going to fit them. Um, I think specifically for this patient um, or this person who commented, some of my symptoms don't match typical IC symptoms. So there could be other things going on as well. You know, maybe we have to treat the IC, but we have to add on other treatments for different types of pelvic pain. So making sure that you're seeing, considering other specialists, maybe you have a component of endometriosis, more of a gynecologic um, oriented pain or gastroenterologic symptoms. So certainly considering maybe you have IC, but other things that need to be treated as well. Thank you. Um, next question. I've had IC pain for 40 plus years and I'd hope to hear new treatments discussed today. What's on the horizon? 
I think that using things like Botox uh, into the bladder, which Dr. Anger mentioned, you know, there is a clinical trial ongoing. There are people who use it now, just like the neuromodulation, it's off label, but because most people have the diagnosis of frequency and urgency, it's applicable. Um, other than that, there is not really a lot of new stuff on the horizon. Um, unfortunately, no one's working on any new drugs as far as I know, but um, hopefully though, you know, with a community like this, people will, in, you know, encourage investigators and other physicians to, to look for something new, but the Botox and the bladder being studied specifically for IC is probably the latest thing that's on the horizon. I think Thanks. Dr. Albert's point, we've almost had to take a few steps backwards with IC in terms of developing treatment options. And we're saying, hey, well, let's actually, we don't even really know what's causing it for so many patients. So we're still kind of more in that discovery phase, but still in the laboratory trying to understand the mechanisms. And then hopefully with that, more treat targeted treatments will come. Thanks. Um, next up, what do you think of acupuncture for pain? Basically, the tibial nerve stimulation is like acupuncture. The advantage is it's covered by insurance, but I have lots of patients who, you know, use acupuncture for pain. Again, you should see an acupuncturist who, you know, is licensed and who is properly trained. I mean, because I don't think acupuncturists have like the same um, probably legal requirements in terms of licensing. So you have to just be careful that someone's just not hanging their signs and their acupuncturist. But I mean, acupuncture has been around for centuries. So there's got to be something to that. And I've had people, a, a test, at least for me, if someone says, oh, I've been doing acupuncture for my bladder, I say, where do you put the needles? They're like, oh, they put them in my ankle. But, you know, if they said they put them like in their forehead, I kind of wonder like how good their acupuncturist is. But absolutely, acupuncture is great. Thanks. Next up, does pre-leaf really help? I think so. I mean, there are people definitely have been using it for a long time. Yeah. Patients in, yeah. Go ahead, Victoria. I was going to say, specifically, if you, you you have a known dietary trigger and you love like your pizza and you know that the tomato sauce is really going to trigger you if you take it um, before an, a known trigger, then I've heard a lot of good success from patients as well. Great. Um, do you recommend PT, internal, external, or IC? Absolutely. Yes, and yes. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right, I have to give the same plug, though. You got to see a pelvic floor PT. I have yeah. patients who, you know, they've got their physical therapist for other reasons, so they trust them, which, of course, you do, but they really should be specialized in pelvic floor PT. You cannot just see a general physical therapist. Um, next question. Are there any treatments for pain during sex aside from physical therapy? The vaginal volume that was mentioned, uh, the disc compound, we have some women who will use that before intercourse, especially if the pain is because, you know, they get so tight and the anxiety of more pain occurring. Um, sometimes using the inner stem will help with things like that. Yeah, there are definitely other things, although I have to say physical therapy in my experience is probably one of the most important modalities to have, but there are definitely other things other than physical therapy. Right. Um, okay, I'm going down here. Um, what dosage of vaginal suppository? That was one of our questions. Yeah. So there's, there's, it depends on what you have in the suppository. So they can, we often do a combination of lidocaine, gabapentin or Neurontin, um, uh, Valium, like, um, you know, which is actually a muscle relaxer that makes you sleepy. Um, if for patients who, if it's, if their insurance doesn't cover like a compounded suppository, I'll prescribe oral Valium and have them put five milligrams in the vagina at night. So it's really, um, it's really kind of at the provider discretion, but if you have certain things you want in, in the suppository that you'd like to request, many compounding pharmacies can definitely make those for you. Um, oh, and the rectal foam. I know. I actually. I think. I know. Dr. Soders, who's one of our colleagues, is is involved in that. But that is a a new study that um, that's I think on the horizon, which is really interesting. Um, but I don't know too much about it. I'm not sure if uh, Dr. Scott, if you've heard of that either. 
I've, I've only heard of the study, but not about the outcomes. But yeah, but I that's a good one for I think we should get involved. <laughs> Um, it looks like we just have a few more. Um, Kathy writes, before you were born, I took a supplement of combined kapha, kapha, and St. John's wort by Twin Labs, and it worked for me really well, but they removed it from the market. Any knowledge about that? I have IC, I've had IC since 1967, and I'm now 84. Um, I, I appreciate you think we're younger than we are. Uh, I mean, St. John's wart. St. John's wart is still around. Uh, the kapha kapha. I'm surprised if you wouldn't be able to get that individually. It might not be combined, but um, yeah, I, I guess. Know, but, I don't have much experience even with a St. John's wart for IC. That that's good to know. I'll have to maybe see if that yeah. uh, that's a good recommendation. It looks like you would have to take it separately. I'm trying to see online if uh, anything that comes up. But I don't, I don't know if Kafa Kafa is still available. Interesting. There's just coffee, Turkish coffee. <laughs> I think Turkish coffee. I think we might be out of luck. That's sad. Hmm. Um, thank you for that. Um, next question. How do you feel about daily antibiotics? Um, it says nitrofurin toin as a preventative to prevent an infection, which causes flares. So I will, um, I will, so many times as all of patients who come in that with symptoms that present exactly like a UTI, but they're culture negative. Um, but often they will have had a history of some of the time they have positive cultures. Some of the time it's negative, which means we're suspecting IC. So those patients in, in that case, when they definitely have a history of positive cultures, as well as um, flares that are probably not positive, I will put them on low dose macrodantin or other any other um, kind of commonly used preventive antibiotic. It could be Bactrim for those who don't have a sulfa allergy, nitrofurantoin, um, or even um, Prolaprim, which is Bactrim without the sulfa. I will do a low dose antibiotic um, daily for about six months to get the infection question out of the picture. And then we can actually um, identify if they are having IC flares. But usually I don't use the antibiotics preventively for patients that don't actually have positive cultures at all. Cause then we're sort of treating IC with antibiotics, which as many of us know, it can really um, disrupt our natural flora in the, in the vaginal area or urethra. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Are there any scientific theories about why the bladder gag layer becomes damaged? You, you can tell from the silence, the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's the cation phenomenon that acidity in the urine some people are just more susceptible to having damage from acidic urine, but um, some people I think, think that, there's an infectious cause as well, in addition to those other things, but we don't know. Yeah, I agree. Okay, and I think I think you address the foam questions, um, and then it looks like the last one is, um, what do you think of DNA testing for UTI if it does not show up in urine culture? So DNA is a very hardy um, structure, if you will. So even if bacteria are dead, you can still have DNA. Um, and DNA um, tests have definitely not been widely accepted as any type of gold standard yet. You know, I think that if someone persists on having that and they want to treat the antibiotics see if they get better, I think it's fine. But the Oftentimes what I'll see is people keep coming back with these positive DNA tests and they get treated and they're no better. So I think we're treating a result as opposed to treating what the person really has. Yeah. So just keep in mind, DNA does not always equate live organism. Mm -hmm. And there are these theories, um, for example, in um, England that, that, you know, a lot of symptoms are from these, what we call biofilms, that there's bacteria hiding in crevices in our bladder. And I'm not saying that those are definitely um, not there, but when we have those theories do 
end up re re causing patients to end up getting over treated with antibiotics. Um, but we do, I think, I think these are really promising studies, but I, I do agree with, um, with Dr. Alber that they, it can end up where you get treated for something that's just there, which may not be, may just be living there or living there or not even, not even living, but being dead there. And we end up over treating. So we just have to be careful about those, you know, sort of these new technologies. Okay. We had, we had two more questions pop in. Would you like to just take those two and then we will, um, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, Next one. My gynecologist recommended a prebiotic probiotic called Happy V after examining my swab. Do you have any thoughts about that? I think it's important for everyone to know that if you swab anyone's vagina, you will have organisms. That is normal. Our vagina is full of lots of different organisms. The best probiotic or prebiotic, however you want to call it for the vagina, if you are perimenopausal or menopausal is vaginal estrogen because it promotes growth of the good bacteria. And also, although there are certain common good bacteria, we don't really know, like everyone has their own individual microbiome. So for me personally, the best probiotics are avoiding antibiotics excessively, which we see a lot of getting treated. And then the reason why vaginal estrogen is so important is the vaginal lining becomes thin with perimenopause and menopause. It is the cells that are shed from the lining of the vagina that provides food for the good bacteria, which is predominantly the lactobacillus or lactobacillus acidophilus. Those lactobacilli make lactic acid, which helps to keep the vagina normally acidic and that acidity keeps the other organisms in check. So that's why, you know, it's same with like the preventive antibiotic. Yes, these things are sometimes necessary, but it's better, at least in my opinion, to treat the underlying problem. Thank you. Um, what do you think of peptide therapy? I love peptide cream for my face, but I don't know. <laughs> I, I do love, believe in peptides. I just don't know there's anything out there for IC just as of yet. Okay. Um, one more popped in and then I promise this will be it um, because she it, she sent it right when we were saying that was going to be the last one. Are you aware of viruses that cause Hunter's ulcers? That's a really great um, question. And I think um, there are certain studies being done looking at what we call the microbiome that, um, you know, do um, Hunter's, are Hunter's lesions associated maybe with bacteria that we're not capturing or viruses. Um, but I don't think we know that yet. Yeah. But we want to know that. We're going to study yeah. that. <laughs> but they're really hard to grow. But I think that's also, you know, it's very thought provoking. Maybe that's why when we burn the ulcers, people get better because maybe we're killing a local, you know, collection of some type of organism. But yeah, it's, it's a it's a great question. We just don't know the answer to it. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Drs. Anger, Albert, and Scott. Today's session was so informative and you went above and beyond by answering all the questions and we are so grateful. Um, we hope that all of you enjoyed this webinar and learned something new. Um, if you found this event to be of value, please consider joining us for future webinars and share these opportunities with your community. Um, we'd also like you to um, mark your calendar for June 26th for our next webinar um, titled Your Journey in Clinical Trials, Expectations and Impact. Our speaker will be Dr. Robert Moldwin, ICA Medical Advisory Council member, um, and the link will be in the chat. Um, we just wanted to let you know also that we are marking our 40th anniversary this year. Um, and this is significant because the ICA has been the sole nonprofit organization dedicated to ICBPS for four decades. So uh, please be sure to keep an eye on your inbox for ICA emails, follow us on social media, and participate in our 40th anniversary activities. So thanks again for joining us today. And um, we look forward to seeing you on future webinars. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.